So the first time I read this book of the Iliad, I was convinced that I had just read the most petty, overblown, insignificant fight ever between two guys that were way too full of themselves for no good reason. I was very, very wrong. This is a fight that happens every day. Hello and welcome back. Today we're going to go over book one of the Iliad. I'm going to read a summary of what happens throughout this book, and I'll also provide analysis and commentary throughout. Number one, it's important to look at the first lines of the poem, in which the poet invokes the muse to sing the rage of Achilles. You see, this explains where the poem begins, and why, and also, eventually, where it ends. So we start at the event that causes him to become angry in the first place. Chryses, a priest of Apollo, has offered King Agamemnon a large ransom to release his daughter, who was taken as a slave by the Greek forces in a previous raid. Agamemnon refuses, because he enjoys her too much. So Chryses asks Apollo, his god, to inflict the Greeks with a terrible, deadly plague until they give his daughter back. As we go through this epic, it's important to keep track of who is getting angry, at what, what's it motivated by, and when they stop, or if they stop, especially in this first chapter. First, Agamemnon is angry at Chryses for trying to get his daughter back, so he refuses the ransom offered, and threatens to kill the priest if he ever sees him again. At this point, his motivation appears to be mainly lust, although you could argue power as well. The plague kills many of the Greeks, and Achilles calls the army together as he speaks to Agamemnon to address the issue. If the plague does not stop soon, they will be forced to return home. Achilles suggests that they question a prophet to determine what god they have transgressed and how. Now, Apollo is angry at Agamemnon for treating his priest so horribly. But the plague doesn't touch Agamemnon himself, it attacks his soldiers. And why? Because he wants Agamemnon to make it right, to correct the offense. The prophet that the Greeks choose, one of their own soldiers, speaks up very hesitantly, knowing that he will offend. They get their answer and Agamemnon is angry that the circumstances demand that he has to go without a prize while all the other Greeks still keep theirs. He suggests that he will ask for another prize to be given to him to replace Chryseis, the daughter of Chryses, fearing the disgrace of going without while those under his command still keep their prizes. Agamemnon is angry again, this time at having to give up Chryseis. I'm under no illusions whatsoever as to what these slaves were used for by Agamemnon and the rest of the Greeks here, but it's important to keep in mind that this was not just about lust for them. It's glory. Receiving slaves like this, captured in war, was considered by the Greeks here akin to receiving treasure. It was just part of the prize and part of the loot that was apportioned out. Both the slaves and the treasure were meant to signify and give honor and glory to the ones who received it. Obviously that's wrong, but that's how they thought of it. It's why Agamemnon uses the word disgrace when talking about how he would appear to the other Greeks, having no prize while those who are supposed to be beneath him keep theirs. If you're not convinced, we can also see that this is about glory by looking at the words that Achilles uses to respond to Agamemnon. Achilles is at first confused by what Agamemnon is saying, and reminds him that there is, at present, no loot or women lying around that have not already been given to one or another of the Greeks. He states that to try to take something back for himself would be disgraceful, and that Agamemnon should instead just be patient until they capture more. Agamemnon suggests that by challenging him on this, Achilles is trying to cheat him. He then doubles down and insists that he absolutely will take another king's prize by force if no one gives to him willingly, maybe even Briseis, Achilles' own slave girl. At this point, he's just threatening. Agamemnon has not decided whose prize he's going to take, but he's just saying that he would do it. Achilles' response to Agamemnon suggests that he might be appeased by treasure or women, which again suggests that this is about glory, at least to some extent. Furthermore, Achilles is not trying to belittle Agamemnon here. He seems to feel scandalized that Agamemnon would even suggest that he might do something like this. Once he confirms that he means what he says, though, Achilles then begins a long tirade of insults, berating Agamemnon. He begins by denouncing his willingness to wrong the men under him, despite the fact that they all came to fight as a favor 
to him and his brother, they're not operating under the same moral compass that we are. However, ironically enough, this is moral outrage that Achilles is expressing here, at least at first. But then he continues on to express his anger that Agamemnon always takes the greatest share of treasure whenever it is captured, despite the fact that Achilles is usually the one doing most of the fighting. He ends by promising that he will leave Troy and go to his home, no longer willing to win glory for Agamemnon, little for himself, and then only to have what little he is given be under threat of seizure at a moment's notice. Agamemnon retaliates and declares that he will commandeer Briseis from Achilles in person to prove his superiority so that no one else dares to challenge him. Achilles nearly kills Agamemnon there and then, but Athena holds him back promising that he will be paid back many times over with glittering gifts to pay for this outrage. Okay, remember the promise of the glittering gifts. It will definitely come back throughout the epic. Nestor, another king and an old advisor to Agamemnon, tries to break up the fight by both validating and challenging both men's points, trying to make peace, but he is ultimately unsuccessful. So Nestor's argument is that the kings should receive the most honor out of everybody, but that they shouldn't use that power and prestige to disgrace those beneath them. Nestor does a great job, I think, trying to break up the fight, but each of them is trying to win the most glory for himself, and they're not easily going to be reconciled. It's also apparent that Agamemnon has always disliked Achilles, as seen here. It was not just this one incident that earned Achilles his ire, and whether because of Achilles' attitude or abilities or frankly both, he feels the need to overcompensate and put him down in order to maintain his own status, despite the fact that he is winning most of the battles for the Greeks almost single-handedly. Likewise, it's clear that Achilles has kind of held a grudge against Agamemnon, too, for quite some time. Meanwhile, Achilles was promised eternal glory in exchange for his short life, his early death, horribly, in battle, here at Troy. But he isn't getting it. And furthermore, Agamemnon goes out of his way to insult him and disgrace him. Achilles swears that he will not fight for Agamemnon ever again, no matter how much he or the rest of the armies plead with him. The two men go their way. Agamemnon, despite having boasted that he himself would take the girl from Achilles, sends two underlings after Achilles to his ship to collect her, while simultaneously sending Odysseus to return Chryseis back to her home. So don't get me wrong, this is a fight between two egos, but we see versions of this fight play out all the time. It, this could be between an employer and an undervalued employee, or someone that takes a friend's help or favors or goodwill for granted. Obviously here the circumstances are much different, but after that, it's clear that this is a fight that could happen to you or me tomorrow. How would you react? Who do you see yourself as in this scene? Achilles gives Briseis up without resistance, reassuring the terrified messengers that they have done nothing and are not to blame. Achilles then prays to his mother, weeping at the disgrace that he has suffered. Thetis hears his prayer and comes to his side to hear what has happened, and he begs her to intercede for him to Zeus. His honor has been hurt, and he wishes to have it restored and magnified by giving strength to the Trojans in their fight against the Greeks. The more the Greeks suffer in battle without him, the more honor Achilles gains. Achilles is going to take revenge on Agamemnon one way or the other. Had Achilles decided to kill him, he would have easily gotten away with it. No one's going to get in the way of Achilles when he decides he wants to kill someone. However, Athena prevents him, and so he decides to prove his power in another way, through inaction. Effectively robbing the Greeks of their greatest fighter, while asking Zeus to give the Trojans more strength as they fight them, guaranteeing the deaths of hundreds of them because of his grudge against Agamemnon. And he will continue to do this until the offense has been corrected. That is, until his glory is restored. Does that sound familiar? It's exactly the behavior of Apollo when he was driving a plague against the Greeks himself. Homer is making the point throughout this novel that Achilles is such a powerful man that... His anger, when unleashed, appears to be that of a god rather than a human being. Thetis agrees to this request and laments aloud how short her son's life will be, how short it already is, and the current lack of glory that he has received for it. She goes to Zeus and begs him repeatedly, Come, grant the Trojans victory after victory till the Achaean armies pay my dear son back, 
building higher the honor he deserves, while Zeus stays silent and ponders. He asks his mother to intercede for him, knowing that at one point in the past, she had saved Zeus from being overthrown, and he expects that Zeus owes her for that, and that she can use that to his advantage. What Achilles does not know, as you know from the last video, is that, to some extent, Zeus owes Achilles a lot more than that. If Zeus had gone through with his marriage to Thetis, then Achilles would have been Zeus's son, which would have meant he would have been born a god, the greatest of the gods, would have succeeded Zeus, and would have been the king of the gods. Instead, he's given a short life as a mortal, and his one consolation, his one compensation for this, that he was promised, eternal glory, isn't even working out. Furthermore, Thetis may indeed also feel cheated by Zeus. After all, he arranged her wedding to preserve his own power. So, taken together, I believe that Zeus's silence as he ponders is one of pity for Thetis and Achilles and all that they've suffered for the sake of him getting to keep his throne. Pity, then, moves him to make sure that just this one thing can go right for Achilles, no matter the cost to him. Zeus finally responds, making a solemn, unbreakable vow with a bow of his head that he will do what Thetis has requested. Though, he complains about how much criticism he will get from the other gods, especially those that favor Greece in the war. The bowing of his head is considered an unbreakable vow, something that not even Zeus, the most powerful of the gods, can ever go against. We will see the gesture used and symbolized several other times throughout the epic, so it's important to remember now. And we'll leave it there. Next up, we'll be reading book two. Thanks for watching. Please let me know down below if there's anything you found especially interesting, or if there's something that you think that I missed that I didn't talk enough about that you want to hear more of. Thanks again, and we'll see you next time.